There are three sacraments of initiation. What are they? Just shout them out. Baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. Two sacraments of service. What are they? Marriage. Marriage. Interesting, huh? Father John unlocked that for us, didn't he? And what's the other one? Holy orders. That's a little bit more self-evident to us. So sacraments of healing, of which there are two, and we've talked about them all at this point. They are sacrament of reconciliation, which heals the body, right? <laughs> it heals our souls. And then the sacrament, there is a sacrament that heals physically. And what's that called? Anointing of the sick. Now, we've talked about all of them except for one. Which one is that? That's right. Somebody's keeping track of this. So we're going to talk tonight about confirmation. And so to complete our discussion of, of the sacraments, I want to walk us through the Bible a bit here. Because I think it's helpful for us to understand the biblical roots, the biblical origins of the sacrament of, of uh, confirmation. So let's look at Acts chapter 8. Verses 14 to 17. So you've got the four Gospels. The Gospel of John is followed by the book of Acts. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Okay, here's the situation. The uh, apostles were all clustered in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the center of the early church. Most of Jesus' followers were clustered there. And then persecution arises and it scatters the followers of the Lord, except for the apostles who stay in Jerusalem. This is just after the martyrdom of St. Stephen. And as the disciples are scattered, they proclaim the gospel. And in proclaiming the gospel, people began to get converted. So this happens in Samaria. So now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had heard or received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So this is one of the things that you see after the day of Pentecost, is that the apostles are imparting to the newly baptized by the laying of on of their hands the gift of the Holy Spirit, the grace of the Holy Spirit. And the understanding seems to be that this grace coming through confirmation completes what God began in baptism. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 7. You with me? And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth... Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. Everyone knows who Paul is, right? 
there he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, what an interesting question to ask. Why do you think he's asking that? Pardon me? I, I don't think so. I think he comes among this group of people who seem to be dedicated, religious folk, serious about following God. And he, something's missing. He observes. I think it's there's some spiritual discernment. He knows what to look with when, fe when people have been initiated into Christ, baptized, confirmed, or prayed for for the release of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And he's, hmm, I'm not seeing what I would expect from disciples of the Lord Jesus. What seems to be missing? The work of the Holy Spirit. So he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no. <laughs> we haven't even heard there was a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. John who? John the Baptist. So John prepares for the coming of the Lord by preaching a baptism of repentance. They don't know about Jesus. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul had laid his hands on them, you see this gesture again. Paul lays his hands upon them. And the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There are about 12 men in all. So here again, this linking between baptism and the, this apostolic prayer for the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the baptized. These two seem to be linked in the scriptures. One completing what God has begun in the other. Okay, the letter to the Hebrews. This is near the end. Chapter 6. Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, let us leave the elementary, or maybe you could say foundational, doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God with instructions about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So he's trying to call these people to maturity because the foundation has been laid. But notice what he links again. Baptism and the laying on of hands, which is for confirmation. So Catholic tradition has understood that this imposition of hands by the apostles in the scripture as the origins of this sacrament of confirmation, which in a certain way perpetuates the grace of Pentecost, you know? 
we go back to the passage in Acts 19 where St. Paul comes among these disciples at Ephesus. On the day of Pentecost, things changed radically for the early believers in the Lord Jesus, didn't they? Before Pentecost happened, these guys are, or let's put it this way, after Jesus is crucified and before they know he's raised from the dead, what are they doing? They're hiding. Then the resurrection happens. <laughs> and after he has appeared to them, he appears to them once on Easter Sunday, it seems, in the evening. Then it says, a week later he comes, and they're gathered, and the doors are still locked. These guys are still scared. I mean, they're glad that their master's alive. But they're still in the grip of fear because they know, being his followers, what happened to him could happen to them. And he's divine, and he can rise from the dead. But for them, well, you get the picture? So they tell him, he tells them, go after, when, when he ascends, wait in Jerusalem until you receive power. So they're huddled, right? And they're huddled because they know what the opposition is like out there. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls. And what happens? Yeah, how do they do that? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is that they're filled with a boldness that makes them witnesses to Jesus. This is an important transformation here from being huddled to going out into the world as missionaries, as witnesses to everything God has done in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see this transformation? On that first day, thousands of people come to faith in Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit has so transformed the men who, upon whom he's come on the day of Pentecost. So when Paul encounters these men in Ephesus in Acts 19, he's looking for the signs that the Holy Spirit is alive and working in their lives. He's looking for spiritual vitality, spiritual vibrancy, and doesn't see it, doesn't sense it. And so this leads him to ask the questions that he asked them. Okay. You've probably all heard us talk uh, in the church here, the parish here, about the new evangelization, about the efforts of our arch archdiocese of Detroit to mobilize the whole archdiocese to engage the new evangelization, to actually encounter the Lord Jesus, to grow in our relationship with him, and then to go out as missionaries. Now, <laughs> as part of preparing for this, the archbishop has been praying, asking the Lord to send a new Pentecost to the archdiocese. That is, a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit that releases the Catholics in this region in which we live, for which our archbishop is responsible, to live missionary Christian lives. 
The Holy Spirit does many things among us. The Holy Spirit enables us to know God in an intimate way. One of the things that the scriptures say, the book of Romans, chapter 8, that it is through the presence of the Holy Spirit within us that we're enabled to reach out to God, crying, Abba, Father. That say, we recognize that the relationship we have with him is a filial one. That we are his own children whom he himself has fathered and that he desires a bond of deep affection with each one of us. This is something we hear about and the Holy Spirit reveals to us how true this is and enables us to move into such a relationship with God the Father. The Holy Spirit transforms our lives. Do you realize that? That the work of transformation is not left to our own efforts alone. The Holy Spirit is our partner. He's the senior partner. And we're the junior partner in this work of transformation so that we grow in holiness. Meaning that the character of Christ is reflected in our lives. And you could say, or might say, reverberates from us. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Other people then begin to recognize Christ in the way that we talk, in the way that we love, in the way that we behave, in the way that we speak. The Holy Spirit, though, also empowers us to live that missionary Christian life. That is, he wants to liberate us from our fears our inhibitions in such a way that we are not ashamed or embarrassed by our relationship with Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit, but are thereby therefore eager to share with others about the difference that Christ has made in our lives and the difference that Christ has can make in their lives. This is all the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And in confirmation, in a special way, the Holy Spirit seeks to empower us to live the missionary Christian life that a Catholic Christian is called to live. We are invited and urged and equipped to take up the responsibility to spread and defend the gospel of the Lord Jesus by our words and by our actions. I think that part of what God is up to in the, in the Catholic Church right now is this transformation from many being simply spectator Catholics. Do you know what I mean by that? They come to church to watch. And there's beautiful things happening in liturgy, right? I think our eyes have been opened to what's going on in the liturgical action. It's powerful. It's beautiful. We're meant to watch. But watching isn't an end in itself, right? We're not meant to be mere spectators. We're meant to be missionaries. Some speak of it as a transformation from being consumer Catholics to being missionary Catholics. Consumer Catholics, what do you think that means?
Yes, I think it could mean that. But also consuming. It's like, hmm, I'm here to get. Yeah. This is about me. I'm here to absorb everything I can consume. But are we also meant to give? Are we also meant to be witnesses to Christ? Yeah. And so it's the Holy Spirit's work to help us make this transition from being spectator Catholics to missionary Catholics, from being consumer Catholics to lay apostles of Jesus Christ in the world. We're men and women who are sent into the world to transform it and to sanctify it, make it a holy place. This is the church's understanding of who we are as lay, as Catholic Christians who are living in the world. But in order to do that, we need power from on high. A power that liberates us from those inhibitions that makes us want to keep our faith private. You know what I mean by that? Nobody would know I'm a Christian. I dare not say anything about it in the public forum. But the gospel isn't meant to be a private affair alone. The gospel is meant to be shared. And we're meant to look like Christ, act like Christ, and speak on his behalf in the world. You get this picture? So this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to produce this kind of transformation among the people of God who have been baptized. Okay, one of the things that you'll notice as we, uh, as these, as you receive the sacrament of confirmation, so very early on, to better signify this gift of the Holy Spirit, an anointing. Now we've talked about anointing before. The smearing of our bodies with oil. An anointing was added in which we're perfumed oil is applied to our bodies along with this laying on of hands. That perfum perfumed oil is called chrism. The name chrism comes from the name of Christ himself. The word Christ, Christ is actually a title. We use it like a proper name, don't we? Uh, like it's Jesus' last name. But, but actually, it's a title. And it means the anointed one. That the Lord Jesus himself Remember when he was baptized in the River Jordan? What happened? The Holy Spirit, the, the heavens open. It says the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. And so he is anointed by the Holy Spirit for the commencement of his ministry as the Messiah, the anointed one of the Lord. So chrism is tied to the name of, to this title of Christ, the anointed one. And the word Christian also is tied to this. We also are anointed ones, anointed with the Holy Spirit. That tells us something. I, I think part of what it tells us is that we're meant to share in the life of Christ but also meant to share in the ministry, the, the mission of Christ. 
So when an infant is baptized, an infant is anointed two times. An infant is anointed with the oil of catechumens, so signifying a sort of spiritual cleansing. And then after the baptism, the infant is anointed a second time, this time with sacred chrism. And it signifies his participation, his call to participate in the priestly, prophetic, and royal ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, in order to sort of signify this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this, this consecrated oil, perfumes, really fragrant smell to it that we call chrism is used to anoint all of those who are baptized and it's signifying their participation in Christ's life and Christ's mission. This is confirming everything God began in baptism and it's strengthening that grace and deepening that grace. So we're going to conclude here by talking a little bit about the signs in the sacrament of confirmation and the rite of the sacrament of confirmation. So anointing in the ancient world and in early Christian tradition is rich in meaning and symbolism. Uh, we've already talked about the pre-baptismal anointing, the oil of catechumens. That will happen. Bob, when do we do that in our CIA? A couple weeks before you. Okay. So there will be a moment when the oil of catechumens will be smeared upon your body, and this will signify cleansing and strengthening. So spiritual cleansing, spiritual strengthening, the Holy Spirit already beginning his work in you, even if you're not baptized. The anointing of the sick, another place where we, sacramental oil is used. And in that case, it's signifying healing or some sort of spiritual comfort or strengthening to embrace and endure the trial of sickness. Sometimes it's spiritual strengthening in preparation for our final journey. Post-baptismal anointing with chrism. And then finally, the chrism that is, we're anointed with in confirmation. Okay, the idea of the anointing is to express that the one who is anointed is set apart. Consecration means to be set apart for a holy purpose. Now, people are anointed in the sacrament of holy orders. <laughs> When a priest or a bishop is ordained, sacred chrism is used to indicate that these men are being set apart for a particular ministry within the body of Christ. It's like this in confirmation. You're being set apart for the Lord so that you belong to the Lord in a special way. The way that uh, St. Paul talks about this is that we're set apart in such a way that our lives give off a new fragrance or aroma. He calls it the aroma of Christ. There's some beautiful stuff in 2 Corinthians, uh, St. Paul, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, where he talks about this fragrance that is meant to attend the life of a Christian. This reminds me of something. I, I was visiting a friend, a good friend in South Bend, Indiana. This was years ago. 
my friend lived in a, a building that had two flats in it. And he had the flat on the main floor and the second floor, but there was also a flat in the basement. So there was someone living in the basement that I had never met. And in this uh, house, we shared the same sort of driveway and parking area. So one day, we had so many people in my buddy's flat that we had made it difficult for the guy living in the basement flat to get out. So he knocks on the door and uh, just asks if we could move our car so that he could get out of, I think he was in the garage. Now, I missed this whole exchange, but I walked into the kitchen. There was a door to outside in the kitchen. I walked into the kitchen after the exchange had happened. And there's this fragrance lingering in the air. I said, whoa, to my buddy. I says, what's that I smell? He said, our neighbor was just in, I think that's his cologne. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, isn't it, that the fragrance lingered after he was gone. He was no longer present. But the fragrance was. So when St. Paul speaks of us as the aroma of Christ, you see, he's not here in body, right? But his fragrance is. And he's saying that people ought to be able to pick up his fragrance. Pick up the aroma of Jesus because his people are so closely associated with him. So deeply are our lives permeated, penetrated by his, the sweetness of his presence. That when we're around one another and when other people are around us, Ooh, what is that I smell? It's as though they ought to be able to get the width of Jesus. This happens the deeper our lives are surrendered to the Holy Spirit, then the more this aroma ought to be released. You know, Pope Francis has talked about shepherds he says they ought to smell like the sheep. You heard him say that? I say around the sheep so much that they pick up the scent of the sheep. And analogously, it's true for us as Christians, around Jesus so much, so saturated, so to speak, with his presence, that we ought to smell like him. And people ought to be able to pick up his scent, smell his fragrance, the aroma of his presence when they're with the people of God. Okay, this is what this anointing with chrism is meant to set us apart for. I think it may be part of the reason why the oil is so fragrant. It's in itself symbolic of a life that's meant to be fragrant because Christ is dwelling in us. Quite Christ living in us, acting through us, speaking through us. Okay, what's the effects of the anointing that the confirmand receives. See, we receive, the scriptures say, a mark. That is the seal of the Holy Spirit. A seal is a symbol used in the ancient world of a person. So the seal usually would represent a person. And it indicates what belongs to that person 
or it indicates that person's authority. You know, it's not so different from a logo. Now, sometimes you'll see, uh, well, you see uh, people wearing, yeah, sweatshirts, T-shirts, and they have the logo of their favorite sports team. And all you have to do is when you see one, for me, you see maize and blue. <laughs> I know some of you do. <laughs> uh, she said, they, we, I get so angry. <laughs> <laughs> or sometimes it's the, the, the mascot. You know, uh, maybe what, the, the wildcat. Or whatever the, 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 the mascot is for that sports team. All you have to do is see it, and it speaks to you, ah, he must belong to or he must be a fan of such and such a sports team. A seal was like that in the ancient world. It was a mark placed upon a person. The mark represented a person. And it meant that it was meant to indicate that the authority of the one it represented. So you've all seen in the movies people sealing letters. They'd pour wax on them, and then they'd stamp it. And the letter would be sealed. And when you received the letter, if the seal was broken, what would you know? Somebody for whom that letter was not, to whom that letter was not addressed opened it. So the letter is, is indicating with its seal that this is authentically from the one whose seal is stamped upon this letter. You get the picture here. So when we're confirmed, the Holy Spirit seals us. He's trying to say something to us about whose we become through his presence and activity in our lives. Let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Verse uh, 13. I'm going to start at verse 11. Uh, St. Paul says, In him, that is Christ, according to the purpose of the one who accomplishes all things, according to the counsel of his will, we who first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We're marked. We're marked as belonging to the Lord, as being his possession. Possession in the sense that someone may say, that's my girlfriend. She's mine. Don't even bother. She's mine. It's the mine of love. It's that sense of the possessiveness of love. So the Holy Spirit marks us as being the Lord's possession, but it's the possessiveness of love, not the possessiveness of like owning a piece of property. You get the difference there? He also, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 
verses 21 to 22. He says, but it is God, this is St. Paul again, who establishes us with you in Christ and has commissioned us. He has put his seal upon us and given us his spirit in our hearts as, the, as a guarantee. So there again, that, this, this mark that's placed upon the Christian uh, as through the Holy Spirit's work in his life Expressing who's that person now is. He belongs to God. We'll see what's, uh, what's on your minds about uh, the sacrament of confirmation. Can, maybe I can ask you a question to get us started. Since you're being shy. Is confirmation the first time that you receive the Holy Spirit? It isn't? When is? Okay. <laughs> oh, so you're on your P's and Q's here, huh? <laughs> it, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things we'll say when we're teaching the kids uh, is that in when we're baptized, it, what, the, what, the, what, what we do is we'll, we'll put a glass of milk on a table, and then we'll pour chocolate syrup into the milk. And what's, what's the syrup do? It goes right down to the bottom. And, you know, slowly it starts to kind of affect the milk in the glass. But then, when you take a spoon and you stir that up, what happens? Yeah, the whole glass of milk gets flavored uh, as the chocolate syrup permeates everything. And so, well, that glass of milk with the chocolate sitting inside uh, we'll say to the kids, this is like what the, this is an image of what the Lord does for us when, with, through the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. He's present in our lives, just like that syrup is now in that milk, and you can see it. And then in confirmation, what happens is the Lord stirs up this gift within us so that the Holy Spirit permeates everything with his presence. And, I mean, it's just an image, right? But the, the kids find it helpful, and believe it or not, so do their parents. <laughs> yeah. Samaria. Yeah, and and so I, I think there too, uh, the the understanding isn't so much that the Holy Spirit isn't present, because you know you read the New Testament, and it's theology about this. Yeah, He's present, but. I think they're, they're looking for the kind of thing that they've all experienced on the day of Pentecost. So, so the apostles, let's take the apostles for an example. Was it, I think, the, was it Jesus' second appearance to them? I forget. But it's talked about in John, the Gospel of John at the end, where he appears and he breathes on them. And what's he say? you remember? Receive the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them, <laughs> uh, just before his ascension, wait in Jerusalem until power 
You're clothed with power from on high. So something happens. There's an equipping that happens when Jesus breathes upon them. And yet there's something, there's an additional work of the Spirit in them on the day of Pentecost. And it so releases them to mission, to become missionaries, may be a better way of saying it. And I think this is, what he, that this is part of what they're looking for. They're also looking for the apostolic involvement. They know that the apostles uh, at this time, and this, we would say it's still the case through the bishops, uh, plays a special role in uh, the imposition of hands for this kind of stirring up of the work of the Holy Spirit so that he is permeating everything and bringing uh, these people to uh, that uh, sort of profound appropriation of what Jesus makes available to them. That help? It's also we're saying that when, remember, we said that there's the persecution that arises because of Stephen. And then this, this, the scattering of the believers. And the gospel then begins to cross cultural boundaries. And so as it does this, they are concerned that the apostles be involved to, shall we say, give their blessing to all that's happening here. As the, it took something for, for the uh, the early disciples of Jesus, to, grow in their realization, that Christ, was for everyone, not not just the Jewish people where his ministry began and who were his own people, according to the flesh. But he was for everyone. And so Samaria represents one of those, okay, the gospel has now crossed a boundary. These aren't the Jews who are responding. Th this is a different, a different people group. And so the involvement of the, the apostles was sort of significant in this... Uh, as the gospel begins to cross cu cultural boundaries. It is true that in the Eastern churches, they keep, they keep them together. Uh, ba uh, baptism and confirmation happen at the same moment. So one is baptized and then Im I immediately, uh, immediately confirmed because of the tradition you see in scripture of this, this close and intimate link between these two sacraments. Now, in, in the, the Roman church, as the church grows and, and uh, as it spreads, uh, the ideal is to keep the bishops involved because they are the successors of the apostles. And their presence in, in laying on of hands and anointing with chrism is an expression of our unity with the apostolic origins of the church. However, when the, as the church grows, like 
For instance, we've got baptisms that happen here every other week. So every other Sunday. Just this past Sunday, I had baptisms after the noon mass. Uh, six different babies we baptized. Now, every, C Kathy, you keep track of it, I think, don't you? And that, uh, I mean, it's not unusual to have that many that we're baptizing at once. So that's just OLGC Parish. Now think of the archdiocese and all the parishes in it. I don't know how many are here I, because this isn't my own. Uh, but think of all the different parishes scattered around the archdiocese and baptisms happening with some regularity. How do you keep the bishop involved, which has been an interest of the, the Roman church to keep the, the bishop involved if there's so many baptisms happening? And so gradually there was uh, uh, a move to uh, temporally separate the two sacraments so that the priest of the church could do the baptizing and then the bishop stay involved by doing, usually it's regional confirmations where you get a whole set of parishes that come together with all of their children and, uh, and then the bishop uh, performs his ministry of confirming. Uh, the Eastern churches have delegated to the priest not just the baptizing, but also the confirming. And so that the bishop's not involved, but the, the, the presence of the bishop's ministry is signified with the use of chrism. That is that holy oil that must be used that only the bishop uh, can consecrate. So it, it, it's the growth of the church uh, and the numbers of people baptized and uh, that, are, that are being baptized and the sheer challenge and impossibility of keeping the bishop involved in conf confirming everybody that's being received into the church at the time they're being baptized. This has led to so the theological development, shall we say, about the practice of the sacrament. Age of discretion, which can be defined by the bishops. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, theologically, shall we say, not necessary, but pastorally, that is the direction that the, uh, the, the Western church, the Roman church has gone, is to want, uh, to, when you ask what are the requirements for confirmation, well, baptism was, is one of them. But we're also asking in our pastoral experience that the, those who are coming forward for baptism be at the, arrived at the age of discretion. This is true. And so, again, these are developments that have tended to lead to a temporal separation between the two sacraments. Though the theological and spiritual link between the two remains quite intimate, but maybe a little harder to see and appreciate because of the temporal separation. That makes sense? Second grade for what? Yeah. And what grades do we do it in? Is it still second, isn't it, for First Communion? Yeah. Fifth right now. That that's a special 
as a special experiment here at OLGC because in the archdiocese, the age is normally what? Eighth grade. Eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and in my diocese of Saginaw, uh, so the, the kids are baptized as infants, typically. And in second grade, both confirmation and first Eucharist. Yeah, at the bishop's discretion. Now, this is one of those issues that is being sort of debated, I think, among the leaders of the church. They're trying to discover what the will of Christ is about how these sacraments be administered. Actually, I, I didn't say this, but uh, not just baptism and confirmation, but first Eucharist in the East, all at the same time. Uh, Eucharist is administered usually a little differently. So usually in a spoon, something like a spoon, with the body of Christ and the blood of Christ in the spoon, and then it's put into the, the infant's mouth as an expression of the, these three sacraments are sacraments of what? Initiation. Yes. Uh, I think they did it because of the unity of the sacraments. I think that was the driving thing. Uh, practically speaking, how much the infant mortality rate influenced them, I, I have no knowledge of myself, but I wouldn't be surprised. Still today, if an infant's in danger of death and the, day, the age of confirmation and uh, First Communion are some years off, in the case of an emergency like that, everything can happen right away. So a baby can be confirmed in the, Cat the Roman Catholic Church and, and receive his first communion. Same with an adult. I mean, I, we had an adult in RCIA who was a candidate rather than a catechumen. She'd been baptized. Her whole life long wanted to be a Catholic. And here, near the end of her life, she finally decides she's going to join RCIA and do it. And in the middle of RCIA, she got ill. And uh, final illness. And I went to the hospital. We confirmed her. And First Communion, right there. So danger of death is a special circumstance. But in a world where death is a threat for infants at all the time, Un unlike the world we're living in today, at least here in the United States. Uh, who knows how much that influenced uh, the practice? I saw a hand somewhere over here. Yes. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Laying on of hands. It's part of the confirmation, right? Laying on of hands and then anointing with chrism with special words, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting, that language. It's the same language as Acts. It can sound as though receive the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm baptized. I thought he was in me. And so it's, it's not denying what has happened to you already. It's just saying you can receive more than what has happened to you already. You, you get that? So it's interesting the language that's used in the sacramental rite. This is from the Catechism. It says, although confirmation is sometimes called 
the sacrament of Christian maturity, we must not confuse adult faith with the adult age of natural growth, nor forget that baptismal grace is a grace of free, unmerited election and does not need ratification to become effective. St. Thomas St. Thomas Aquinas reminds us of this, and here it quotes him. Age of body does not determine age of soul. Even in childhood, man or person can attain spiritual maturity. It's the disposition of the person. This is what our sister is saying to us. If you're baptized, the Holy Spirit is there but often the disposition to cooperate with, to succumb to, to surrender to his presence and activity and what he wants to do in our lives is not present. Do you realize that? And confirmation can be the same, a ritual that is real and does something, but the fruit that it bears is tied with the disposition we bring. And so St. Thomas says, even in childhood, man can attain spiritual maturity. As the Book of Wisdom says, for old age is not honored for length of time or measured by number of years. Old age. He's saying you can have a five-year-old that's old in Christ in terms of his or her spiritual maturity. Many children, through the strength of the Holy Spirit they have received, have bravely fought for Christ, even to the shedding of their blood. Because they bring the disposition to, of receptivity and responsivity, if that's a word, to this grace of Christ that's present in them. They want to let him have his way. They want to cooperate with what he's trying to do in them and through them. They are yielded. And so often, we are not yielded. You know, we're putting limits on where we're going to go. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> It's like sometimes you take your dog, off, dog out for a walk. This is a bad analogy. <laughs> Turn that off. <laughs> sometimes you take your dog out for a walk and the dog seems to have a mind of his own. You know what I mean? And you're constantly yanking, yanking. No, 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 no. We're going here. We're going here. So sometimes we've got a mind of our own. And the Holy Spirit is saying, no, I want us to go over here. And you've seen people walk dogs who've got their own mind, you know? <laughs> They're determined not to go. And they keep resisting. And so what Aquinas is saying, there, there are kids. I've met some of them that are so surrendered to this gift that is living in them that they have passed people who have lived in Christ for 50 years. So think of what's possible for you if there is yes and surrender in your heart to the Holy Spirit as he's trying to lead you. Will we let ourselves be led or are we trying to lead him? Are we resisting him? And the more we're open, the more we experience, the more faith, the faith in the sense of assent and receptivity to what he's trying to do, the more we experience. And the more we try to control it and keep it under wraps, the less we see. And one other thing, I want to read you something that it's in the prayers of the Eastern Church, one of the liturgies of the Eastern Church. 
at the time of uh, speaking about confirmation. Actually, I'm sorry, it's the consecration of sacred chrism, which in the Eastern Church is often referred to as Myron. Father, send your Holy Spirit on us and on this oil which is before us and consecrate it so that it may be for all who are anointed and marked with it holy chrism, priestly chrism, royal chrism, anointing with gladness, clothing with light, a cloak of salvation, a spiritual gift, the sanctification of souls and bodies, imperishable happiness, the indelible seal, a buckler of faith, and a fearsome helmet against all the works of the adversary. That's something. He's, he, he, the, they're, they're trying to, in the words of the liturgy, describe what God wants to do through this oil. So this is what is available. You know, I think one of the great ways to prepare for your baptism and confirmation. Now, you've heard us talk about all the sacraments. And some of you are preparing to receive three of them. Some of you are preparing to receive two of them. Lord, give me a heart that is ready, eager, as receptive as I can possibly be to all of the graces you make available to me on Holy Saturday evening at the vigil. Tell God, I want it all, Lord. I want it all. Understanding that that means I am prepared to cooperate with it all. You see that? These two prayers go together. Ask him to root out the fear, the resistance, the inhibition, the desire to control, to be in control. Because this is an obstacle. This one, the desire to be in control, an obstacle to the Holy Spirit's work and all kinds of things. If we could be in charge, there'd be no problem. It happened on our timetable when we want it, the way we want it. But when God's in charge, it's when he wants to deliver it, and it's coming the way he wants it. And that scares us. So this is something to prepare for through prayer that the hindrances in us, God, God can deal with, ask him to deal with it. And if you think you need prayer for it, remember our weekend together and what we learned about unbound prayer? Well, there may be more unbound prayer that we need to do in ministry to each other. But I think the more we can come to that moment as receptive and yielded as we can be, look out. Powerful graces that uh, God wants to release in our lives at the Easter Vigil.